You're listening to Level Up with Melissa Zalouf from Iron Source. Welcome back, everyone. You are listening to Level Up, the podcast for people who love making, growing, and of course, playing mobile games. I'm your host, Melissa Zalouf, and this is the fourth episode of our series for indie developers called What I Wish I Knew When. Joining me on today's podcast is Bozo Jankovic. Yes, I think I got it right. Did I get it right? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> Good. Uh, based in Serbia, Bozo uh, heads up business development at Game Biz Consulting, um, which helps game developers from indies to global giants scale their businesses. And considering that Bozo and, and the team you guys work with developers day in, day out, um, especially regarding kind of monetization, we thought it would be a good idea for him to discuss the things he wishes he knew about monetization earlier on in his career to help developers at the beginning of their own journey to get on the right track. So Bozo, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. So first off, um, we like our guests to, to sort of share a little bit about their journey uh, in the gaming industry and how you uh, ended up working at, at Game Biz Consulting. Absolutely. Yeah, so my journey with the games industry started um, a few years ago now, uh, back at Nordius. Um, so Nordius is a game development company uh, based out of Belgrade, Serbia, and is one of the biggest companies in Southeast Europe, and they are widely known for their uh, top 11 football management game, uh, which is one of the most successful uh, football games on the planet. Uh, there I was working in a game uh, in business development team. Um, and um, yeah, a few years afterwards, I decided to um, kind of move into this consultancy role where I would be helping uh, different game developers. Um, and my focus uh, at the moment is at ad monetization. So helping game developers monetize their games through ads and maximize their potential there. Mm -hmm. and, and what kind of games do you guys work with at GameBiz? So uh, we really work with different types of games from different genres. So we definitely focus on uh, mobile free-to-play games. But uh, within that, uh, we really uh, work with uh, you know, all sorts of genres from, from uh, me personally, I was working on action games, uh, puzzle games, uh, match free, uh, board, um, uh, narrative driven games, um, sports. Uh, so all kinds of games that, uh, that, you know, have interest in monetizing with ads, whether it's, uh, you know, making majority of their money through uh, ad monetization or just a, a smaller uh, piece which comes uh, kind of on top of their inner purchase revenues. Mm -hmm. And my assumption is, you know, most of the people listening to this episode either have a game or are building a game uh, that they're hoping to, to, to monetize. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and then you sort of mentioned two here, you have IAP um, and you have ads, um, but there are, you know, you could also tackle subscriptions if, if you felt that that was a, um, an option that worked with your game. Um, and even within each of those categories, there's, there's a lot of different ways to tackle uh, implementation um, and getting it right so that you're maximizing both revenue and user experience. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's potentially start with uh, the basics. Um, can you give us a brief overview of the different ways you can monetize uh, a mobile game? Um, but maybe not sort of like you could use ads or IPs because I think most <laughs> people know that. Um, but kind of let's let's look at IAPs. Um, what are the different kinds of in-app purchases you can leverage? Um, and uh, and then we can move on to ads. Absolutely. So, yeah, within the, the in-app purchases as micro -trans transactions, uh, developers have become very, um, I would say, you know, um, uh, they they have very different ways of monetizing their user users. Uh, it 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 you know it all started with very simple transactions like buying some uh, hard currencies uh, or buying soft currencies through the hard currency. Um, but like as the time uh, passed, uh, developers became more sophisticated in how they can monetize users um, through in-app purchases. So they started. Uh, giving some boosts to users who are who are using them, they they started um, making you know a progression through the game uh, much faster by speeding up uh, build, building uh, time or you know uh, opening up chests or uh, buying some um, diff different sorts of um, decorative elements uh, such as skins. Um, although like for for games that are monetizing through through buying skins, I would say that you know they they rather have um, 
low conversion rates and they're relying on their huge uh, daily active user base. Um, this is a typical um, typical for, for yeah. these type of games. Um, and then like there are various ways in which developers are trying to um, increase their conversion rates and the percentage of users that are buying uh, stuff because traditionally, um, you know, developers are making money for a very small percentage of users who are who are actually buying something in the game. Um, so they have to be um, really resourceful at, at converting with users and offering them different uh, different things that would be, um, you know, attractive for them. And lately, uh, for the last now, well, a couple of years, we, we've seen battle passes, um, which basically don't provide a single purchase, but it's um, actually giving um, upgrades to the rewards that you users would get anyway. Um, and in a way, you know, making it more attractive for the users because uh, the bundle includes all sort, sorts of different rewards. Wonderful. That's, that's, I think, in-depth enough, but um, I feel like there's more you could say there, um, maybe for another episode. Uh, mm-hmm. let's, let's talk about timing. Um, at what point in a game's um, development should uh, a developer start thinking about their IAP strategy um, and integrating some of the things you've just discussed? Mm-hmm. And how is that different from, is it different, actually, from when they should start thinking about how they're going to integrate ads? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I get that question uh, quite a lot. And I like to say that you should start as soon as possible. And this means that, like, from my perspective, there are two main things that developers should be thinking about. Um, first and foremost is, okay, how do I make my game fun? Uh, so users actually want to play the game. And on the other hand, how do I make a living out of this game? Um, So Mm -hmm. how do I make money? And this is something that goes hand in hand. You have to make the experience fun for everyone, but you should uh, motivate at least a portion of your users to buy stuff. So, you know, in early game design, uh, before even any soft launch, technical launch, anything like that, before the game even hits um, the first users on the stores, Uh, I would be thinking about, okay, how do I make money from this game? Um, And again, um, in a purchase monetization and ads um, go hand in hand. Uh, There's no reason why you should be, you know, waiting uh, for more time to pass until you start thinking about ads. And the earlier you start, I think that both in-app purchases and ads will be better integrated inside the, the the core experience of the game and, and you have a better chance of uh, you know um, making the game that uh, that's doing a really good job with monetization mm-hmm. um you've talked about um i mean you haven't used the word hybrid um but mm-hmm. let's let's think about a, a monetization strategy that includes both ads and mm-hmm. iaps um how does that differ um depending on the genre of your game well, I would say that the hybrid mediation um, is almost a, a default uh, nowadays um, within the, the free-to-play games. Um, before, I would say that uh, developers were gravi- gravitating more towards in-app purchases, and then ads were um, probably more suitable for very casual games. Um, but nowadays, I would say that uh, any free-to-play game Uh, can benefit from implementing ads. And then to the point you were making, depending on the genre, depending on your uh, target audience, um, you can actually make the difference there. And, you know, if you have a hardcore game uh, with really core users, um, then you don't want to overwhelm them with ads. And in your hybrid setup, ads will probably take, I don't know, maybe... 5% 5% of revenue, of total revenue, or maybe up to 10. And then if you if you have more mid-core experienced uh, game, uh, then you would be gravitating anywhere between maybe 10 and 20%. And you would, um, you know, have the liberty to include ads more um, aggressively or uh, to make them more visible within your game. And then if you have uh, the, the, the really casual games, uh, you would be aiming for more than 20% of your revenue coming from um, from ads. And there are many games that make, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70% of their revenue through ads. And then, of course, there's that 
extreme of um, of um, you know a strictly ads driven games um, uh, like hyper casual games which make maybe just a couple of percent revenue from purchases. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you um, do you find that developers that you are um, working with are on the fence about ads? Um, are they sort of are ads still a necessary evil, or is it something that developers are more and more sort of uh, considering as a default choice? Yeah, so I I I, I was following one um, uh, research that 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 uh, comes uh, around uh, every year, and one of the questions uh, that developers are asked to is, you know, how do they see ads and uh, precisely the expression you were using, uh, necessary evil, uh, is something that was <laughs> really, really common like a few years ago. Uh, but um, like I, I think that in the past couple of years, percentage of developers who were answering that question with a necessary evil is actually getting smaller and smaller. Uh, so I think that developers are becoming more aware that ads can actually uh, be implemented inside the game uh, without uh, disrupting a uh, user experience. However, there are still many developers um, who shy away from ads, especially mm-hmm. um, especially for some type of games and especially for some type of ads. Uh, for example, there are many developers who believe that interstitial ads are absolutely and always um, you know, bad user experience, that it will lead to churn, or uh, you know, redu- reduced retention that it will drive their users away, which is actually not true based on dozens of games that I worked on. Um, so basically, if you implement the ads in, in the right way, uh, you're actually gonna only gain um, uh, something for your business and and not uh, not the opposite. Um, so you brought up a really interesting point just now um, around this tension between ad implementation um, and user experience um, and how there are certain ads which, you know, are going to, obviously they won't, right? But in, in a bad implementation could cause churn or drive users away um, and ads which might in fact do the opposite. Um, what are some of the ways and, and, and the ads uh, or units that you can use to ensure you're building a positive user experience, but also, um, you know, making money from your game and, and keeping the lights on? Mm-hmm, absolutely. Yeah. So, I would say that for developers who are super concerned about user experience and you know they they feel unsure of what ads are going to do to their game, I think that you know um, to stay in the safe zone, you want to start with reward video ads. Be- the reason why is because uh, you're not pushing uh, pushing these ads to your users, but you're actually um, giving the control uh, to them. If they want to watch an ad, they can. If they don't want to watch an ad, you know, they can just ignore, they can skip. Uh, there, there's no, uh, you know, there's no evidence whatsoever that reward video ads, um, you know, uh, decrease user engagement or um, retention. And all the tests that um, my previous employer and in general my clients have conducted always prove that um, that retention stays stable, if not higher uh, with with reward video ads, and then once you gain the trust and you start believing in this um, um, as a way to monetize your games, then you can start experimenting with other ad formats. Um, I think that for interstitial ads in particular, probably the most important thing is timing. So you don't want to show an ad in the middle of user, you know, playing a level if it's a match free game or you know. Um, if it's a race, you don't want to show an ad in the middle of the race. Uh, you want to um, take those natural breaks inside the game and monetize them with these ads. So after the level, after the battle, after something or before, this is, I think, a good way to use the interstitial ads. And um, I would say for the offer wall, which is also commonly used, uh, again, there's no real, um, I would say, um, uh, the, the, you know, um, there's no danger in driving away the users because of the uh, intrusion, because, you know, usually they're placed inside the shop. Uh, it's just that you should be careful about your economy rather than um, retention and user experience. 
Mm-hmm. And and let's let's talk about segmentation for a second, mm-hmm. um, because I think that's obviously a key point in making sure that you're building. Um, there's you know it's not one ad unit strategy fits all. Um, is it as straightforward um, as splitting up your users into paying uh, and non-paying, and you show ads to non-paying users and no ads to paying users, uh, or is it more nuanced and complex than that? So I would say that it's definitely more complex. Um, and it depends on many different things, but, um, let's take the, 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 what, what, let's start with what you, what you already mentioned, paying users versus non-paying users. Um, I often, um, you know, um, stumble upon this model where, uh, developers say, okay, I want to show ads to my non-paying users and I'm not going to show ads to my paying users. And this makes sense for the interstitial ads. Uh, the reason why is because for users that are paying with in-app purchases with microtransactions inside your game, you want basically to provide almost like a premium game experience. And so you won't be bombarding them with interstitial ads, uh, which they uh, which show up um, basically on their own without users' control. And so paying versus non-paying is fine for, for, for this type of uh, ads. However, for rewarded video ads or for the offer wall, um, I usually um, advise my clients uh, 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 clients uh, against this strategy um, because it can easily backfire. Uh, one uh, one thing that can go wrong is that uh, you're not showing ads, rewarded video ads to, to your users, paying users, and so they actually feel in a disadvantage because, you know, I'm paying inside the game and I cannot get free stuff. So you're actually punishing your users because they're paying, uh, which doesn't make sense from their perspective. And also uh, some of the most engaged users for rewarded video um, sometimes uh, are actually those paying users. So you're limiting your potential for ad revenues and you're also frustrating your users. So that's that's not a good way to go. I like to um, uh, segment the users. So rewarded video ads give user um, ads to everyone. And maybe some parts of the system design are specific to different user segments. So, for example, paying users would have lower caps, whereas non-paying users would have, have higher caps. We would allow them to watch um, more uh, reward videos. Um, also, you can tweak the rewards um, depending on the user level. In the beginning, maybe 50 coins will be enough um, you know, um, for, for the user to make a purchase, to buy something uh, that they need, the booster or something like that. But as they progress through the game and uh, the items become more and more expensive, um, then maybe the rewards uh, that you were giving them before are not relevant anymore. And you need to adjust the strategy based on the, the, the level uh, inside the game um, and so on. So you really need to think about your specific game experience and what are different user segments that make uh, that really make sense. Um, and, and like, you know, it's not only about paying and non-paying, it's also about the engagement, their level, um, which uh, specific features in the game they're using uh, and so on. In your experience, what have been some of the most effective ways, um, you know, developers just starting out have boosted their games up down? Um, I mean, obviously, well, hopefully uh, for many developers, you reach a stage where, you know, you've you've reached your potential and now it's about squeezing the lemon and, and maximizing things. Um, but how are what are some of the ways that that developers can boost their up down early on? Yeah, so I would say that. Um... You know, sometimes developers think that adding stuff will help them with uh, increasing RDAU and then they think of some complex systems and new features and whatnot. And sometimes the solution is, you know, much, uh, much easier than that. It's it's way, way more simple. Um, I would say that, you know, sometimes it can help if they just tweak some things in the system design. Um, in you know the, the the amount of rewards they give to users after they win the level or after they pass the battle, um, or in generally you know economy design, how do they distribute their economy? Um, then there are some tricks uh, for for the in-app purchases, some standard good practices like you know 
piggy banks and, and starter packs and uh, stuff that will help uh, w- with that first uh, first conversion and that will hopefully bring more users to, to paying. Uh, also tweaking the difficulty of the levels because sometimes, you know, um, you have way, uh, way too many easy levels in the beginning and then uh, that first conversion happens too late. Uh, and so, you know, you want to make sure that you read the data correctly and then you try to go for those easy wins. This is for the inner purchases. Um, for ads, um, and of course, yeah, user segmentation is something that's definitely relevant for in purchases, but also for, for the ads. Apart from this, I would say that for ads, it's really important um, to choose the right partners to work with, so uh, the right mediation and the right ad networks, and to, you know, spend some time optimizing um, the waterfall or your hybrid setup. Uh, I would say this is more appropriate term nowadays Um, and also with the ads uh, sometimes is um, as easy as adding a new placement or a new um, format if you're using only for a video uh, try testing some new uh, format if you have only a couple of placements try to find points in your game um, that are highly visible to the user and then introduce a new placement there or increase the caps. Sometimes it can be as easy as changing one parameter in, in the dashboard uh, that can actually you know increase your revenue by 3, 30%, 50%, 100%. I've seen developers who, the clients of mine who've changed mediation and their partners added a couple of networks and they double their um, ad revenue. Um, so you know sometimes it's not about um, complexity and adding more features and spending tons of money and resources into developing stuff, but it's more about thinking, okay, what are the easy wins that I can uh, I can achieve now? Mm-hmm. And and in your in your work, um, what are some? I mean, let's let's say this is going to be hard, but what's the the biggest mistake which you see um, indie developers making when it comes to their ad monetization strategy? Um, so I think that it's going to the extremes, um, meaning uh, they even do too little. Like, let's say they do one ad placement and they do one ad network and they leave it be. So they they don't try to optimize anything. They don't look at the data. They like basically they do one thing and they forget about it. And then they say ads are not working for me. And then, uh, the other, <laughs> yeah. And then the other extreme would be they do too much. So they're like, okay, I'm gonna do reward video. I'm gonna do interstitials, banners, offer walls, uh, native ads. I'm gonna do audio ads. I'm gonna do um, rewarded surveys. Uh, I'm gonna mm-hmm. integrate 20 networks. Although I have 1,000 uh, daily active users, uh, I'm gonna you know squeeze the lemon for the eCPMs and like. They, they lose the focus from the important stuff because they, they spread their attention too wide. Uh, so I'd say that going to extremes is probably uh, the biggest mistake indie developers make in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, and maybe sort of tackling the question from another perspective uh, as our last question and what we always ask our guests on, on this series, what are the uh, main things you wish you had known about um, uh, in the context of game monetization? Although if you mm-hmm. have general advice, that's also fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, when, you get, when you got started in the industry that you think can help game developers today? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I would like, I think that there are so many low hanging fruits uh, the developers um, should make sure that, you know, they've taken advantage of them. Do you have, like, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the piggy bank implemented, starter pack? Do you have a daily login reward? Those um, very common, um, you know, practices, which are really best practices in the industry that don't take a lot of time to develop and they actually provide really good results. So are you doing all of the low-hanging fruits that everyone in the industry almost knows about by now. Um, the second thing I, I would say, um, I would, I think it's really important to get the benchmarks really early on, talk to people, uh, know what are the numbers you should be aiming at, uh, and then, you know, set, the, set those targets. And because sometimes developers make a mistake, they say, okay, but my RDAU is already this high, 
whereas you know they're not using nearly a third of the the potential that they uh, that they have um, and then probably the third thing the power of of data and, and you know uh, if you read the data correctly you you'll be doing user segmentation the right way um, uh, and you know other things that can be easy wins for for uh, for developers uh, that was really helpful. Um, lots and lots of detail in this episode uh, for our listeners. Very, very actionable tips. So thank you very much uh, for being on the show uh, with us today. Um, and thank you everyone else as always for listening. Thank you.